So we're now at our very important question. Why, oh why? So these are it. So I sit down with business owners, I sit down with shareholders, and they tell me these are their problems. Essentially the conversation typically goes something like this. Robert, we intend to grow by X percent, and I say, well, what does that X represent? Usually they give me a revenue number. So I'm like, okay, well, what does that mean? Because obviously, you know, none of us can just automatically double in size and not add a single human being at a single chair, not have to put in another phone line, not have to buy another eye something. I mean, at some point, we're going to have to put something in. And all those things that I just mentioned are all dependent upon heartbeats. You know, the more heartbeats that there are, the more costs that are going to go up. So one of the benefits of cloud computing is you get to have people work at home, subsidize them, they buy their own furniture, they buy their own um, computer, they buy their own printer and all those different things and you just pay them uh, there. But I need to know those different things because obviously now we have more people working remotely, we need to know how big of a pipe we're going to have coming in. We have more people, people like trash create more data. So data is not getting smaller. It's doubling. It used to be every two years, then it went to every 18 months. It's probably now close to every 16 months. Would you agree with that, Richard? So, um, you know, the storage system that you thought was really good, eh, not so good anymore. We kind of uh, swapped that out. So being able to be, have these employees spread out everywhere is really important. Also, we don't exactly have the highest unemployment rate as we once did at the moment. So. Consultants, we go from employees to consultants. There's a lot of consultants out in the world, they need to connect to that infrastructure and collaborate with you as well. Clients need to collaborate with you, supply chains, and your vendors. In case you haven't noticed, we are in hurricane zone. How many of you were here and evacuated in the last hurricane? What a pleasure that was. The funny thing about the uh, disaster recovery and business owners is they never think it's going to happen to them. It's like, it's like a disease. It's like, yeah, I know that's out there. I, I know I shouldn't do that type of thing. I shouldn't, you know, eat that thing or smoke that thing or whatever the case may be. But, I'm gonna, but that won't happen to me. That'll happen to somebody else. True story. Last night, my wife and I are about to go out and... Uh, I get a text message from a former client. She's been trying to get me into her new company. She's in the mortgage banking industry. It used to be a hot industry. Remember when everybody was a mortgage banker? Probably most of your neighbors. At one time, we had 43 clients as mortgage banking companies. 42 of them went out of business. Very popular market. So she calls me, and, uh, or she sends me a text, and she says, uh, this is the actual text. It says, can you restore a server from a tape? If so, how? Now, she's not a technical person, so I'm thinking, things not so good at work today. Uh, so I'm like, okay. I reply, I'm like, yes, you can. However, you will need a few things. One, you will need the original tape drive. Obviously, you can't put an LTO tape in a different type of DAT drive. So that's one. Second thing you need is you will need the software and the correct version that you use to create that data on that tape. That's the second problem. Do you have that? No. Okay, that's gonna be a problem. Do you have another server? No. Okay, so I texted her, good luck, uh, God bless you, hope you have a paddle, because you're in the Brown Creek. So, um, then she texted me back later and said, I think they lost our accounting system too. I don't know how it turned out, I wasn't reading my email today, but I'm not looking for a happy ending when I go look at the email tomorrow. Were they in the cloud? No. They were back on that monolithic uh, architecture where everything was in one office and it was stuck there. Redundancy and reliability. When you're a small company, one of the benefits of going to the cloud is every single thing in your environment, your technological environment, is a single point of failure. I mean, even your workforce itself is a single point of failure. You got one controller. You got one service coordinator, you got one systems engineer, you got one server, one firewall, one internet connection, one, 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 and you're sitting here like this all the time, hoping none of it's going to fail. 
So that's a great reason to go to the uh, cloud, to get rid of that. Scalability. There's all types of scalability. Primarily two types that, that I'm going to talk about today. One is scale up and one scale out. This is where IBM really differs from all the, the other companies in the world. So X5 architecture, am I correct, Richard? Yes. So the X5 architecture, one of the great things about the IBM architecture is that you can take a server, and typically the problem with a virtualized environment is you don't run out of certain resources. Like, <coughs> rarely will you run out of CPU before you run out of memory. Rarely will you run out of storage before you run out of memory. <coughs> You will run out of memory before you run out of everything else. Why? Well, because the typical server has less than 10% utilization on it. That's why virtualization works. So IBM, studying the um, architecture of Intel, mirrored it identically, and they're able to take this device, and you basically take the lid off a server, and you take this X5 piece, and you put it together, and you're able to add, what was it, two terabytes? Three terabytes of memory. Now you say to yourself, why would anybody need that? Because of the licensing models. So the licensing models are done by per processor. So you buy a server, it has two processors, right? Each processor has, you know, four cores, six cores, eight cores, twelve cores, depends on the brand. I guess it would have to be, I guess it would have to be up to six, because we're gonna have to stay on the Intel platform, Richard. But uh, so you have six cores, and the problem is you have plenty of CPU, but you need more RAM. But with the way you pay VMware is you pay them by the core. You pay them by the socket, not by the core. Unfortunately, I think they're going to change all that on us here uh, very shortly. So there you go. So that's the great thing. Change. It's, it's an absolute certainty. So the, so the benefit of the IBM architecture is instead of buying um, like a full-blown VMware, um, if you're buying eight CPU license with support and all that stuff is $47,000. I know that for a fact because I just bought it on December 28th. So that was my Christmas present to ourselves. So um, the problem is if we run out of that and we need to buy another server, well, you know, we would have to scale out. So scale out means we have to spend one-fourth of that, essentially $12,000 for another pizza box to slide into our rack, and boom, we scale it this way. IBM allows you to go this way. So complete difference in architecture. Another benefit is security. Security, security is an obviously, an, it, it's a field, it's so vast, it's so complicated, it has so many facets to it, and it means something different to every company because of the regulations that they're under. So if you're a publicly traded company and you're under Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, your regulations and your definition of security is similar but not identical to the uh, payment card industry, the PCI compliance, or FINRA, financial regulations, or um, HIPAA. HIPAA's my favorite. I love HIPAA. You know the great thing about HIPAA? There is not a single HIPAA auditor in the entire United States. I have clients, our largest client operates in four states, 300 locations, in two countries, and their entire infrastructure runs out of our data, Denver's, data uh, Denver data center. If our data center is not up and running, their cash registers don't work. They don't close ever. Not one day a year, not one holiday, nothing. They are open every day. That's fun. Everyone likes being on call on the holidays. The funny thing about the uh, compliance is a company like that, like my client that does financial transactions, they know absolute guaranteed to within three or four days exactly when the Texas Department of Banking is going to show up and do their annual audit. It is a certainty, just like your tax day, my tax day. They know their audit's coming. But you're a doctor's office. There's no HIPAA auditor strolling in. Well, guess what, Dr. Joe? Time for your HIPAA audit doesn't happen. So you walk into your doctor's office and you can see the screen of the person checking everybody in and there's all the records and there's a HIPAA violation. You walk down the hallway of a larger medical facility and there's no sound masking, that's a HIPAA violation because you're not supposed to be able to overhear conversations. You ever hear it? No. No pink noise in the hallway. They're just running it wide open. 
But the other worlds where the money's involved, we all know Bernie Madoff, financial regulation, that's where the regulation is. Essentially, if you leave here and you can build a network that can pass FINRA and those types of regulations, SEC audits, you basically can pass any type of health regulatory issue whatsoever. We actually did a project for one of our clients. They're the intermediary between Wells Fargo and banks in South America. So they process about, what is it, Robert, like 53,000 transactions a day or something ridiculous like that. And uh, we got audited by Wells Fargo. You know, most audits, <sighs> I'm going to be kind, most audits are not that difficult. They're humorous, actually. A person shows up with little to zero knowledge and a clipboard. And they go, do you have, and you go, yes, I do. And then you explain it to them in as base speak as you possibly can. And they go, oh, well, that sounded good. And they fill off the box. And then they go to the next question, and the next question, and the next question, and the next question. I've literally sat in Sarbanes-Oxley audits and watched the company, my client, negotiate with the Sarbanes-Oxley auditors to get a 180-day password policy because he didn't want his employees to have to change their passwords. Now, you're probably sitting there as majors going, 180-day password policy? That's absolutely crazy. That's the government. It's a guideline. It doesn't say the password policy needs to be every 30 days, every 21 days, every two months. It can be whatever you want, as long as it's written. So that's the wonderful thing about some of these standards. It depends on the auditor. There's no HIPAA auditor. Well, Wells Fargo shows up, totally different kind of audit. They send real technical people. They send an Active Directory expert, a guy that's been doing it before they started calling it Active Directory back in the old NT351 days. They send a person who understands storage systems. They send a Cisco CCIE who wants to read your logs and your IPS and your IDS, and he wants to see all your code. That's an audit. That is like going in for that 41-year-old examination. It is a completely different type of experience. And uh, we passed. And even though we were in a SAS 70 data center, this kills me as well. This facility is like Fort Knox. There's no windows in it. It's a concrete building inside of a concrete building. It's the size of a kind of a super Walmart. It's like 150, 160,000 square feet. Like you stand in the hallway and you're not really sure if you can see the other end of the building. I mean, it, it makes you feel so tiny. You get out on the data center floor, you know, the average server has 10, 10 fans in it. There's 10 to 20, 30, 40 servers in there. Air blowing up from the floor, you can't even talk. We gotta wear uh, noise canceling headsets, Robert and I. You literally, this far away, he and I couldn't have a conversation. It's amazing. Physical security, we're not even allowed the keys to our own cabinets. That's how tight the physical security is. They're stored in a computer. The, the, the security guards don't even know who, whose keys they are. The computer hands them out when they go up and type in the, the client's name and number. Every door you go through, key card, except the restroom. All that still wasn't acceptable to Wells Fargo. We still had to put in cameras so that when you opened the door to the cabinet, it started to take your picture. And my client was like, well, we're not gonna pay for that. And Wells Fargo said, well, we'll pay for it. And I was like, yeah, excellent sale for us. So that's how we got into doing RSA security. <laughs> the maintenance. The great thing about going to the cloud is when you're an enterprise, you cannot afford all the talent you need. That's a reality. You know, if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are just days you just cannot be in all the places you need to be. You cannot do all the things you need to do, and you cannot satisfy all the demands of your constituency, which are your children and your spouse. That's just the reality of life. So you need to be able to have that maintenance done. We're living in a global economy. In America, we're kidding ourselves. There's people from your home countries, parts of Asia, the Middle East, who are living in countries with zero corporate income tax, who are building products, and they're over here competing with me, and I'm paying 35%. So they get, if we make the same amount of money, they get to keep 35% more. So that maintenance can be pushed off site somewhere else. And with shopping, well, people want to shop online all the time so they can get that done as well. 